thank you very much uh, for the introduction. And uh, it is a great honor to, again, be part of this wonderful movement that has started from Fujita many, many years ago and under the leadership of Professor Kato. Uh, it's, a, it's an honor for me to speak in this occasion. And today I'm going to mainly talk about uh, uh, epilepsy surgery. And uh, mainly my focus will be on how to start epilepsy surgery in a very simple setup, not a complicated setup, very, very simple setup. And uh, by using intraoperative ECOG, you can identify uh, the epileptogenic zone. This is my main focus of today's talk. And uh, so before I start uh, my <clears throat> go into main topics, you know, to understand epilepsy, I think we should uh, not only look at uh, the science on a Newtonian perspective, which says that everything is inside the cell and everything is controlled by the cell itself. Whereas um, the Einsteinian thought is that there's something that is involving the mechanism of movement of our body, our brain. So there's a lot of outside influence that can be uh, many things. So to understand epilepsy, just understanding the mechanism is not enough. Just like uh, if you look at this slide here, then you see that this is the dust of iron, which has got uh, no structure as such. But if you put a magnet, a force, a field, then you see a pattern there. So, you know, in uh, epilepsy as a whole, and for epilepsy surgery also, you may not be able to see everything structurally, but then you need to think in terms of function if you want to start epilepsy surgery. So as we all know, you know, brain works by brain, uh, by electricity, and in, in between there is chemicals, where there is a synapse, where there's a chemical, either that's excitatory or inhibitory. So there's a, you know, electricity, chemical, electricity, chemical sort of things. And um, electricity also makes magnet, you know, it generates, when there's a vector, when there's a direction of electricity, it generates a uh, magnet. So in epilepsy, um, we come across magnetic field and study magnetic field like um, MEG or uh, may treat epilepsy by magnet itself. Uh, so since this uh, lecture is for uh, young people, so I would like to go into very, very basics of how a neuron works. So as we all know, the resting potential of a neuron is about minus 70 microvolt. And then when it starts excitation, when there's an excitation, then there is also an inhibition. So there's an excitation, there's an inhibition. And then when that you know, excited threshold is crossed, then you have action potentials. So technically, if the inhibition is not good enough, then you start having abnormal action potentials, which might eventually lead into epilepsy. So these action potentials are generated by different molecules, the salts, or by enzyme like glutamate. And then there are other kinds of salts which excite and, um, sorry, inhibit. And uh, there's also an enzyme called GABA, which inhibit, you know, try to inhibit seizure. So there is a, you know, disturbances between the enzymes and also the molecules that causes seizure in one part of the world. Once you have a generated uh, impulse in your brain, then there is also an inhibitory response which tries to stop the propagation of that epileptic focus into the surrounding structures, which is also called, you know, ictal penumbra. Just like penumbra in stroke, there is also a penumbra in um, epilepsy. But if the epileptic focus is strong enough, then that spreads and then goes and propagate and becomes generalized. So this is the basic mechanism of how epilepsy is happening, you know, all the time. So 
So another thing is once you have uh, electrical impulse that is generated somewhere, then there is propagation, okay? And that propagation leads to new focus of epileptogenic zone, which is also called a kindling effect. So if you want to treat seizure, whether by medicine or by surgery, you have to make them, the patient seizure free, zero seizure and aura free, no aura also, because aura is also electrical seizure. If you do easy while they are having um, aura, then they have uh, electrical abnormality. And as you see in this graph, the you know, epileptogenic zone becomes bigger and bigger with time. So time is very, very important. We need to stop seizure as soon as possible, as early as possible in childhood, and also try to make them zero seizure. Now, the propagation of uh, seizure can happen from different pathways. The bigger, biggest pathway would be uh, corpus callosum from one hemisphere to the other, or it can be from the brainstream spreading uh, sym symmetrically into the two side, or it can be originating from the hippocampus, one of the temporal loop, and then that spreads to the rest of the brain. <clears throat> However, there are so many pathways uh, that is now known uh, to us, which can spread epilepsy. So whenever you think about where the epilepsy is coming from, you should also think how it is spreading to the rest of the brain. And this can be different fibers. Um, and uh, there is a project called Human Connectome Project, which has you know, described almost all the uh, known uh, fibers, which you can, you can see on the MRI also. Now, this is my personal experience. Uh, this is my personal opinion that every seizure is a focal seizure. I don't think there's a generalized seizure or a focal seizure. Every seizure must have a focus. And if it spreads very, very fast to the rest of the brain, then you see it like a generalized seizure. And if it is spread slowly or you know, retained to one place, then you would say it's a focal seizure. And this idea, you know, the actual onset zone or the onset, the concept of on onset was incorporated in ILAE classification of 2017, where they say focal onset, generalized onset, and unknown onset. So the most important part of epilepsy management, especially for epilepsy surgery, is where the epilepsy is generating from. The first part of the semiology, the first part of the EEG, everything, the first part is the most important part. <clears throat> now, why do we need epilepsy surgery? Uh, I'm sure most of us know about that, that all of the epilepsy cannot be treated by medicine alone. Obviously, the first choice is medicine, medicine, and medicine. And the first choice is the basic medicine, the first uh, medicine, uh, the, or the first generation medicine. But the seizure control rate of first drug with one drug is only about 47%. And if you keep adding uh, another drug and another drug with different mechanism of action, then you can uh, get more uh, seizure control, but not 100%. And the efficacy of multiple drugs decrease. And if you are adding third drug, you are just making one more percentage of seizure free period. So at the end, you have 30 to 25 to 30 percent of people who are not controlled by medicine alone. And these are called intractable epilepsy. So intractable epilepsy means if you try two or more drugs for more than two years in a very you know, appropriate dose, and if it is not controlled uh, within that period, then in, it, this is called intractable epilepsy. And then you think about epilepsy surgeon. Now, what are the investigations that you need and what are the technical setup that you need in your institute if you want to start epilepsy surgery? Uh, many, many presentation in big conferences about epilepsy and epilepsy surgery, they present very, very high tech things and which confuse all the young peoples and they think that, oh, epilepsy surgery is not for me because these are the techniques or technology that is not available in my country. So I will not be able to start this. It is not true. 
Epilepsy surgery can be done by a very, very basic um, uh, setup. Like you need an EEG, preferably video EEG, where you can observe the patient for a few days, uh, either off medicine or you know reducing the dose. Um, if you want to do epilepsy surgery, you will need a three Tesla MRI uh, because you can miss uh, many, many uh, uh, pathology if you are not doing three Tesla MRI. But when I started epilepsy surgery, I had very low Tesla MRI. Now I have a three Tesla, but when I started, I had a very low Tesla MRI, but still we could do epilepsy surgery. So it's not mandatory, but it is it's preferred. If you don't have that in your institute, maybe you can send it to somebody who have it and then get. But how to do MRI is most important. You cannot do routine MRI and find these lesions. You have to do a seizure protocol. I cannot describe in detail. You'll have to look it up yourself, but there is a detail of seizure protocol that you need to follow in order to detect, you know, for focal cortical dysplasia or hippocampal atrophy or things like that. Now, another is uh, intraoperative echo, which we are doing all the time in almost all the cases. But many institutes think, especially in Japan, uh, they think that you have to do um, uh, pre-op echo for about you know, six, seven days for every patient. And um, now this is, uh, I don't think it is necessary. If there is a very clear cut uh, case, and then you can go ahead without doing any invasive, chronic, you know, easy recording. So we don't, we hardly do any chronic recording in our cases. Of course, there are cases where we cannot find the pathology. We cannot find the lesion or we cannot find the ictal onset zone. Then we leave this patient behind and say, we, okay, we cannot operate. Just like vascular surgery, let's say you have, um, uh, you know, nice neck, a bifurcation, MCA bifurcation aneurysm. You don't need a high tech things. You can just go in and clip it. But if it's a you know basilar top aneurysm with a complex you know structures, then probably you need a very very good hand, big very good you know surgeon or or intervention. So in the same way, epilepsy surgery will also have levels. Level one epilepsy surgery, level two epilepsy surgery, level three epilepsy surgery. So depending on that, you can start and then gradually build up. That's what I did in the past 20 years. I started very, very humbly, and now we are doing more complicated cases as well. So you can also put depth electrode, very simple depth electrode you can put. If you have a navigation system, you can do it by navigation. Or if you are not confident enough, then you can use stereotactic device to you know, implant this on a hippocampus or wherever you want. And another uh, very good technology that has developed is stereo EEG, where you have these implanted either by navigation, still with navigation, you can implant these EEGs, or you can do by robotics or by stereotaxy. But this is nice to have. But then this is uh, also pre-op uh, chronic invasive uh, EEG. So most of the time we can, we don't need that, you know, it's not necessary. So what is the basic uh, EEG device that you need? You need a simple 16 or 32 channel EEG machine, which can be the EEG machine that you use in the OPD. You just take that to your OR and then use it. And some grids that you need, and uh, most of them say that uh, this is use and throw, but we don't do that. We, uh, you know, uh, put it in uh, the gas and then uh, re-sterilize and reuse it. So, you know, many types of leads that you can buy. Uh, so this is like 32 channels. This is eight channel different shape, depending on your corticotomy. Or this is very good. This is for hippocampal head. And the other one is for um, hippocampal tail. And uh, these are depth electrodes, so it's also nice to have during ECOG surgery. So video EEG, you know, you can see uh, both semiology and uh, uh, the EEG at the same time. Time. So you need to have, if you want to do um, epilepsy surgery, so you, then you need to have a video EEG. Just like this one, you you can see that there's a certain synchronized, uh, and then that is seen 
and uh, this is a general onset tonic motor type of seizure. And uh, so you can, you know, pretty well know what's going on. But here, if you see, this man is already having electrical seizure, but there is nothing in his, you know, you don't see anything. And gradually he's turning his head towards the left. And, um, you know, and then his dystonic posturing of the left hand, he's feeling something in his left hand. And uh, then he has got uh, this almost generalization. So uh, it's a right frontal uh, building up uh, eventually with figure of four and then generalization. So you know where the epilepsy is starting from. Uh, semiology, EEG, both is there. Another case, this is a temporal lobe epilepsy, left hippocampal sclerosis. Now you can see that the lady already had seizure from the left hippocampus, but you know, her visitor, her sister do not notice. And she is fumbling her cloth with her left hand. You can see this, this is called automatism. And most of the time it is on the same side. Now she's having, you know, almost, almost both hemisphere is already taken off, but still, you know, now she has noticed. So this, in this, the propagation is slow. The propagation is slow. So you can see that, you know, this is uh, building up into generalization. So the most important part of um, patient evaluation is um, the semiology, the symptomatology of Caesar. And there are many, many hallmarks of uh, ictal and post-ictal lateralizing signs that you should remember and then ask this. So whenever a patient comes to you, you should ask what happened first, not at the middle, not at the end. First, what happened? What did your patient do when he was normal and suddenly what did he do? Did he just started spitting? Did he started having you know, convulse about one hand or, you know, there's a lot of things that can happen. He, did he, he stop speaking or did he have automatism of speech? So detailed history of the early part is most important. Then you do a routine EEG, which will show you uh, the irritative zone, which is um, the, you know, interictal sharpened spikes, the sharpened waves spikes that you can see just like here in, F4 that you can see there's an interictal. So you, you think that this is the irritative zone, but you don't know whether the seizure is coming from here or somewhere else. It's just irritative. You can know, but it's best to capture the seizure itself. And then when you capture the seizure itself, then by video easy only, you can see all these things where there is a buildup from one place. Like here, uh, there's a buildup from F4, the same patients. And then now you know, okay, F4 is the uh, place where the patient is having seizure. Now rest you can do by interoperative echo. You don't need to do anything more than this. Um, if you do two or three days video easy, then um, it's very, very difficult to analyze all these things. It takes a long, long time. So artificial intelligence in the form of different softwares are available in the market. And uh, Persis is the one that we are using, but there are others. Uh, so you should also uh, incorporate that. Uh, and then, you know, all these raw data you put, and then they will make it into very short period, like five minutes or two minutes. Uh, and mainly they will show you where the has happened so that uh, you can see it better. Now, another thing that has just been incorporated, uh, we have not been able to incorporate this technique is called high frequency oscillation, HFO, and um, in the form of ripples or fast ripples. And this is a, a very strong biomarkers in epilepsy surgery. And this can also be done uh, invasively before surgery or in the OR itself. We have just started doing this uh, we don't have enough data, so I don't want to comment on this, but uh, there are a lot of papers on this, and this is a very, very important biomarkers now. So once you have the semiology, uh, once you have a three Tesla MRI, good imaging where you see that there is a sclerosis or a, a fiber muscular dysplasia or something, and the EEG also tells us, then they, you create a triangle, and if all shows and guide you to the same point, let's say in this case, left hippocampus. If left hippocampus is sclerosed, you see that the 
uh, semiology is left hippocampal and the EEG is also showing left hippocampus. Then you are very, very safely take the patient without any further investigation uh, for surgery. But then of course, uh, left hippocampus, you want to see whether memory is being supported uh, by the other side or not. But the most of the time, take it from me, the left side hippocampus, if it is seizing for a long time, then the memory is already shifted to the other brain. Now, so now we are doing this ECOG, interoperative ECOG. So I would say it is not a triangular concordant, but it is a rectangular concordant that we create. Now, with this all information, what you find, you find that uh, there is a lesion, let's say, or it may be a MR negative uh, intractable seizure. I will talk about that later. Or it can be, you can know where the seizure is starting from by video EEG. And there may be post ictal you know, functional deficit. And HFO will show you um, mainly the epileptogenic zone, but uh, interictal discharge, as I have showed you, will show you the irritative zone. So you try to understand these things before you go into surgery. But still, you are not 100% unless you go in and start doing eco. So my first case, 2000, uh, and uh, this man was 13 years with uh, complex partial seizure, very, very straightforward case, you know. And he was uh, having, you know, three to four seizures per week. And he was socially incapacitated. He stopped going to school. And he had a right-sided medial temporal sclerosis, typical complex partial seizure. So we did a straightforward, you know, anterior temporal lobectomy. He is uh, now 20 years or more after surgery. And he did have a single surgery, a single epilepsy after that, and uh, leading a normal life. So the epilepsy surgery is really a life-changing kind of surgery and uh, um, very, very passionate surgery, you know. So as you can see here, uh, I did a very, very classical six centimeter right-sided temporal lobectomy with amygdala hippocampectomy. Uh, this, most of the neurosurgeon can do it, you know, unless uh, uh, after some training, especially when you reach towards the brain stem, you need to, you know, uh, retain from going into the uh, depth. And uh, so I, we call it, you should limit your dissection within the arachnoid plane. So 20 years, no seizure. Uh, so there are many cases like this. Now this gentleman, this boy, 18 years, IT student, uh, 2.5, only 2.5 years of right-sided focal seizure and also some, uh, you know, uh, some uh, ictal vocalization and automatism and also had generalization. You see that in the flare image, you can see that the, mostly the head and maybe the body of the hippocampus is sclerosis. Amygdala is not much changed. And then uh, we did a video EEG, uh, where you can see that he has got uh, a left-sided, you know, uh, onset, and you can see that there is also automatism in him. Here also we see the same thing. So generally we try to capture two uh, seizures, video EEG seizures without invasive leads. And then uh, if we, they, it is concordant with his semiology and MRI finding, we go for surgery. So when there is a, uh, this is a case of a MR negative uh, temporal lobe epilepsy, but um, here also we did or uh, ECOG interoperative, and so that it was only the hippocampus that was firing and maybe part of the amygdala. So we just did a selective amygdala hippocampectomy in this case. Um, I rarely do this kind of surgery. Most of the time I take out the lateral structures because um, we may miss some of the epileptic part and they may have record. And so most of the time we don't do it. But when it is a strong firing that you detect and there is no firing from the lateral temporal structures, then you can leave them behind. This boy came to me almost in status epilepticus uh, focal, uh, uh, fo on focal side, on right side. And if you look at the MRI, he has got a cortical dysplasia on two area here and here. And it was on the left side, pretty large. We did a functional MRI and tried to, you know, uh, 
but he was young, so we could not do a awake surgery in this boy. So we depended on functional MRI and neuromonitoring system. And um, then we, uh, we opened pretty big, and then we put um, uh, 16, uh, uh, 16 leads uh, ECOG. And uh, then we can see that there is, it is firing from almost everywhere in the left side of the brain, but mainly on the cortical uh, dysplasia side on two space. So we also did a depth reading, a depth reading also showed the same thing. So we removed focal cortical dysplasia, focal cortical dysplasia, and then still there was some firing. So we tried to disconnect the front occipital fibers, but the patient was not seizure free. He was having smaller seizure again and again within the same hospitalization. So we again went in and took out a part of um, the remaining brain, which was connecting these two structures. And then the patient became completely seizure free and didn't have any deficit as well. So sometime you come across a patient who present with epilepsy, and uh, when you remove the tumor only, then you are not trying to you know, treat the patient completely. You are only treating the tumor, but not the epilepsy. And the patient come to you with epilepsy, not his chief complaint is not tumor. Tumor is your, your diagnosis. So this case, uh, the frontal you know, low-grade glioma, almost near the motor strip, and the patient has a seizure always during sleep, uh, sudden opening of eye version of the eye followed by bilateral tonic streaming of the body. So it was lateralizing pretty fast to the both side. And uh, he also had vocalization, but like screaming. And But then patient was most of the time aware of the situation, uh, but sometime he had generalization. And uh, he also had one episode of status epilepticus, which is, you know, very, very dangerous situation. So obviously we wanted to remove the tumor, but then we also wanted to cure him from his epilepsy. So this may be a very good starting point for those who want to start epilepsy surgery in their institute to start with uh, tumor cases who present with epilepsy and then you know, build up your own knowledge. So left hand was about four millimeter from posterior border of the tumor and left leg was 29 millimeters. So we were needed to preserve somehow the left hand. So this is uh, the operating fill. And uh, then we also put uh, the, we also identified the motor strip uh, by neuro uh, navigation and uh, center sulcus was identified. And this is what it looked like when we opened. The tumor is pretty small. There's a vein going there. And that is the motor strip which controls the hand area. So we wanted to preserve that uh, somehow. And uh, so in intraoperative ECOG, there are five grades. Uh, uh, grade one is very low amplitude spikes. And grade five is almost synchronized epileptic, you know, uh, interictal uh, finding. So here we looked at uh, the, uh, uh, we did a four, four lead. With this, you can search around, you know, like this, 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 you can search around. So we searched around and waited for a few times. And then we saw that this is a very epileptogenic area here. And uh, this one also very epileptogenic area, just adjacent to the hand area. And uh, but uh, score of three, score of four. And uh, then when we studied everything, then we realized that this is the extent of the uh, excision that we need to do. And there was a lot of firing here. There was a lot of firing here. There was almost no firing over the tumor. So tumor was not epileptogenic. The surrounding uh, brain was epileptogenic in this case. So uh, and then we removed and then, you know, and at the end of the uh, test, we again retested the, with the ECOG and see that all the part is, has become silent. And if there is a still a continuous spike, especially arising from uh, the motor area, then you can add multiple subpile transjections, you know, crossing, cutting the intersulcal fibers uh, so that the action potential do not spread 
outward. So this is a post op. Here you can see, okay, this man has become silent. Now we have removed the tumor and we have also stopped their epilepsy. So you are confident and you can go home happily. Uh, another case, um, 43 years female, right-handed with left-sided big tumor, uh, very near to the Broca's area. And uh, she has a, a frontal uh, complex partial seizure, you know, mainly behavioral arrest, loss of awareness followed by uh, tonic-clonic seizure uh, for a few minutes. And uh, she also had post ictal headache, vomiting and sleepiness. And uh, there was a tumor there. So here again, we did uh, anterior, lateral, posterior, medial, you know, uh, ECOG uh, reading. And then you can see this is a bipolar mode. This is a unipolar mode. Here you can see, you know, uh, there's a phase reversal here, and there's a phase reversal here, and post op it has become silent. So maybe um, this is uh, uh, one, this is uh, about three. Uh, another case of a cavernoma, you mainly cavernoma, uh, they have microbleeds, and these are very, very epileptogenic. And this patient also have, uh, you know, frontal lobe generally have uh, epilepsy seizure during sleep and it can come in cluster and it spreads to the other side very fast. So these are some of the characters of frontal lobe epilepsy. And um, so he also had during sleep an MRI showed a cavernoma. So we had a lesion, we had a semiology. Now we needed uh, EEG. Intraoperative EEG was not very convincing maybe left side, not very convincing. We could not decide just by this. But since there was a lesion we, and then there was a microbleed, we decided to operate on this gentleman. And um, then uh, we did um, again ECOG on, uh, on supposing uh, tumor area, uh, this uh, cavernoma area. Anterior, there was, the anterior was most firing and uh, above was not much firing and posteriorly there was nothing. So then we put a depth electrode targeting uh, through the navigation, targeting anterior to the cavernoma somewhere like this. And then we can see this, there was a six lead on this uh, depth electrode. And we can see that, you know, the most potent was on the very deep area. And then once it came out, the electrical activity became smaller and smaller. So we know that this is the source of the epilepsy and the track is coming out towards the surface and then spreading out from the cortex. So then we followed that track and then removed and then post-op we again confirmed that the brain is silent. And that is the inter-op, you know, immediate post-op that you can see that we have tracked down. It was not only the cavernoma, but the track itself was also epileptogenic. So we had to remove the track as well. Uh, MR negative case, left side most likely by semiology. Uh, MRI is normal, EEG is doubtful. Again, maybe left side, but not very confirmed, T3 reversal. So then we took this patient, uh, before we took this patient, we put a hippocampal uh, depth electrode from both sides, right and left, and then uh, studied uh, this for overnight. And then... Uh, you could very clearly see that on the left side, there is uh, interictal firing and on the right side, it's silent. So we knew it's from the left side, you know. So we went into left side, but then uh, we did a water test pre-op in this patient. And then uh, these days we don't do water test, but uh, uh, at this time we were doing water test. And uh, water test said that uh, there is part of the memory is on the left side. So probably we cannot remove the hippocampus. So we did a multiple transaction of the hippocampus on this gentleman. And initially the patient did very well, uh, but eventually the seizure recurred. Uh, so we had to take out the hippocampus and uh, he became seizure free after that. And, uh, but then uh, he had no memory problem. Most of the time, you know, if it is an uh, epileptic hippocampus, epileptic limbic system, then these are already dysfunctional most of the time. Uh, another case of a 13-year female with four years, uh, you know, uh, 
complex partial seizure, mainly frontal type with secondary generalization. MRI looks not very uh, clear, but maybe left frontal a little bit of atrophy, but we are not very sure. And uh, easy is intermediate phase reversal, but it's a uh, and poly wave, poly spikes on both sides. Because frontal lobe, if you have uh, epileptic activity, is generally goes into the opposite side. So you don't, you sometimes cannot lateralize just by uh, surface EEG. So in this case, what we did was um, we put, um, you know, the usual uh, 1020 EEG on the skull. And then also we opened the very big uh, flap, and then we did ECOG on this side, and then we compared. And our idea was if it is going bilateral, then we will do a corpus callosotomy and maybe remove the part of the brain that is abnormal and see what happens on the other side. This was our idea. But when we went in, uh, the brain was firing only from this side and most of the uh, was only after catch up from uh, the same you know, activity that was crossing through the corpus callosum. So we had to you know, tailor this uh, up to nine centimeter, almost uh, nine centimeter of the frontal lobe needed to be removed on the uh, right side to make this child, um, this uh, ecology free from activity. So we had to you know, tailor backwards until we got the silent uh, feature. Now, this is my probably the last case. Uh, this is a uh, 22 years male. And this patient was having, as you can see, uh, unilateral atrophy of the brain and uh, on the left side and right side weakness since birth. And we advised him for hemispherotomy, but then they declined the surgery. And one day he came to us with four days of status epilepsy because from a very, very remote play, village. So we tried everything and nothing worked. Then we again opened up the brain and then you know measured both sides. And actually he was having generalized tonic clonic seizure, but it was all coming from the atrophic brain and not from the normal brain. And uh, so we did an emergency corpus callosotomy, full corpus callosotomy uh, in this gentleman and the status epilepticus stopped. So this is uh, a rare, you know, only one case where we had done emergency corpus callosotomy. I didn't talk about corpus callosotomy today. Corpus callosotomy is a very, very good indication for, you know, drop attacks. And sometimes if it's a frontal lobe epilepsy, but you are not very sure, then you can do a corpus callosotomy and wait and see where, how the, you know, EEG lateralize and then maybe go in second time and do the surgery. But this gentleman, obviously, is, as you see, there was a lot of you know, atrophy on one side of the brain. So he continually have, uh, I was having focal uh, seizure. He stopped having generalized seizure, but he had focal seizure. So we eventually put him on VNS, vagal nerve stimulation. And now his seizure is gradually uh, decreasing. VNS, if you put, it do not uh, work immediately, it takes time. And uh, there's about 50% reduction in 50, 50, 50 kind of thing, you know, not very effective. The best is if you find the lesion, do the surgery, that's the best. Now, um, this is an old data actually um, of 471 intractable seizure who are candidates, uh, almost two years. I have not updated my fresh data, but then there's only 77 whom we operated, 31 were anterior temporal lobectomy. Uh, selective amygdala hippocampus we did on four cases, and lobectomy with uh, hippocampus MST on two, frontal lobectomy eight, lizardectomy only 23, corpus callosotomy, and BNS one. So as you can see, you know, uh, out of these cases, we had extremely good result. 89% of our patient either had uh, only aura or scissor free. And uh, there was one mortality, and uh, there were a few cases where we needed to do, you know, multiple surgeries. But um, epilepsy surgery has got a wonderful result, and this is very, very underutilized uh, sector of neurosurgery. And uh, I think more and more young people should take up 
uh, epilepsy surgery. If you want to take up epilepsy surgery, then you have to have a nice epileptologist, neurologist, psychiatrist. That's good. But you need to learn your own EEG. You have to read your own EEG. This is uh, the teaching of my uh, institute, uh, Hiroshima and other institute where I learned this technique. Uh, and also the Japanese people, uh, the Japanese neurosurgeon think that, you know, at least the surgeon should also know that he is, he is operating on a focus that he has seen. Otherwise, you know, there's a conflict of interest. So having said that, I, in my talk, and uh, we have a, a residency program going. These are our residents. We have 11 residents now. And uh, uh, you are most welcome in our institute. Uh, for, you know, short or long-term, you know, a training program. We do, you know, all kind of uh, neurosurgery in our institute, uh, uh, you know, DBS, listening, uh, epilepsy. Uh, so you can come and uh, visit our institute. Thank you very much. Thank you again for listening. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor. That was uh, an excellent presentation. Uh, I would request uh, Professor Poon to please kindly comment on uh, Professor Basan Pan's presentation and uh, some uh, comments about your experience about uh, epilepsy surgery. Hi, um, thank you. Um, so it was a very wonderful lecture from Professor Pan, uh, very experienced uh, epileptic uh, neurosurgeon and uh, all kinds of um, different way to uh, treat the epilepsy cases. Uh, it was very amazing to me. Uh, especially uh, how you apply um, the ECOG uh, to achieve a very complete uh, seizure free after your resection. So, um, uh, so I, I know Ben had a question. So, uh, shall we let uh, Ben to ask the first, uh, first question? Yes, Professor. Ben, are you there? Yes. yes. Yes, uh, Professor, thank you so much uh, for your excellent lecture. It was really uh, exciting to know uh, your results and your experience. It's very educational, very comprehensive. And uh, congratulations to your uh, excellent uh, surgical result. So my question is about the uh, imidal uh, hippocampectomy. So what kind of approach um, would you choose? And uh, what, uh, uh, in, in your understanding, what is the extent how much it will we move to get uh, your good um, uh, epilepsy surgery result? My second question is about the uh, connectomy. So, um, so how how uh, in your center do you uh, use, or how would you uh, uh, voice your thinking of your uh, of the use of the connectomy? So, um, uh, would you uh, want to use or use this as a tool to study the? The pathogenesis of the of the epilepsy uh, in different patients. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Ben, uh, for your both uh, very important questions. You know, uh, the first question: How do I approach uh, most of the cases that we do uh, temporal lobectomy? Uh, if it is on the right side, we stay away. We we do not follow uh, minimally invasive. Uh, so most of the time we take out a uh, six centimeter of right side uh, temporal lobe. And uh, if it is mainly medial temporal sclerosis, I leave the superior temporal gyrus uh, behind and then take out the middle and inferior. And then how much of hippocampus to remove? This we do by putting um, the two leads that I have shown you. One is on the head. Uh, you put the uh, uh, head lead on the uh, hippocampus and then revert it and then put the same thing on the amygdala. So you can know where it is firing from and then how much, how long to uh, do. I do it by tailoring uh, with uh, another longer, smaller strip that I showed, uh, which we put on the hippocampus body. And um, then we want to make at the end, we want to make uh, this silent. So once it's a silent, then uh, our job is done, you know. And uh, about the connectome, uh, this, is, uh, this is going to be very important from now on. I know it. Uh, but uh, studying uh, individual fibers has not been possible in our institute yet. 
And uh, so we are, uh, either we depend on semiology, which is very, very crude. And another is if you have uh, multiple, if you can put multiple uh, depth electrode like SEEG, then you can, you know, find out the pathway from where it is spreading, you know, from which to which it is spreading. So you can guess, and then that may give you a more, uh, in, uh, more information on how much to dissect or how much to disconnect. Uh, at this point, we are mainly uh, uh, on depth electrode that we put. We put one depth electrode, maybe two, and then study, and then put another two, something like that. We have not put many, many electrode at the same time. But that is the place where SEEG will really work and tell you how it is propagating. You know. Thank you so much. And and another thing yeah. in my talk is um, uh, this time I didn't include in my talk because then again, it will become fancy and we don't have that technology. It's called MEG, as you know, a magnetoencephalograph, mm -hmm. which will show you uh, where the ictus is generating from. And it will also show you the spread, how it is spreading. Uh, in our neighboring country, India has uh, started uh, using uh, MEG and uh, we are waiting for their own, you know, data to come out and then maybe collaborate in few difficult cases. But most of the time you don't need all these things. Most of the time, if the case is straightforward, then you can just do surgery uh, by doing ECOG only. So this is the point that I wanted to stress today. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor. Your lecture is very important. And uh, we are so glad that to have you here in uh, our wireless webinar. Thank you very much. Uh, I, I very um, agree with the professors, uh, uh, the initial talk, uh, the view on the level of epilepsy surgery. And everybody, if is interested in epilepsy surgery, they can start with the very simple and the recessive surgery first. It, it doesn't really uh, limit it because you have no uh, those um, high tech fancy um, equipment. Because um, all the way uh, we want to do is do uh, resection if possible and resection is uh, the uh, principle of neurosurgery uh, to, to start with so I'm, I'm glad the professor had um, uh, strength on this um, uh, uh, philosophy uh, for people who are interested in epilepsy thank you thank you thank professor. you very much also, so we'll move ahead with the uh, uh, expert opinion of the discussion. Uh, we have Professor Kastadin, Professor Irion, and Professor Ahmed uh, Pawad Pirza. Uh, Professor Kastadin, please, your expert comments about uh, Professor Kastadin. Yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Dr. Zachi. I think the first I would like to, 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 to congratulate uh, Dr. Basampan for his achievement. It is really a, an excellent work. And considering the, the, the difficulties in which you have gradually to increase your equipment to really achieve the, the latest uh, uh, strategies and um, perform the latest uh, protocols, it is really, really impressive. Um, there are many questions that will be continuing to be developed with his. He has created the basis of that. And uh, everything that he mentioned, whatever it is, as uh, simple as uh, decision making to during surgery or the condom applied, it will be well fitting to what he has done. Um, it is it is really uh, somehow reminding me what because I did my PhD about thirty five years ago, even more. Uh, on temporal lobe epilepsy. And I have started with temporal lobectomies and amygdala hippocampectomies. And they were then really only with uh, interoperative uh, uh, electrocorticography before later on after decades, much uh, uh, more sophisticated equipment has appeared. Um, it is really an excellent program. I may ask you just technically, so how, how, what is the, 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 the rate, for instance, of uh, MRI positive uh, epileptogenic lesions of uh, the whole population of your patients? What is the relative percentage of that? And also during the electrocorticography, what kind of uh, anesthesia at all would you apply to obtain the excellent results? Do you awake, how much awake you put your patients and so on? Yeah, thank you. For the first time, uh, it's nice to meet you again after a long time, by the way. <laughs> it's really a pleasure. Thank you so much. Yeah. 
um, uh, first thing, I don't have the answer about any, you know, uh, epidemiological study. We don't have that much of epidemiological study on epilepsy. Uh, it is not a big priority, you know, although it's a life-changing surgery. Uh, so I don't know about that, but uh, many of them are lesional. non lesional um, we hardly, we try to avoid. We only do try to do the good cases. That's why my result is also good. Excellent. I must confess that. Excellent. And uh, yeah. so everything, then only I go in uh, and yes. I don't want to, you know, create trouble. And uh, secondly, about anesthesia, you know, <coughs> Most of the anesthesia is okay. Uh, most of, but only thing is when we are doing eco, we just want to have the patient a little bit uh, lighter. Uh, that's all. And um, we don't want cold uh, irrigation. Uh, cold irrigation will stop eco reading, yes. you know. Suppress. If you have inter, if Sorry. you have seizure, then you put ice water, you know. So uh, cold water, we do not allow. It should be warm water. That's all. Very simple. And uh, we have never had any problem. So it's like, you know, um, the monitoring uh, with, uh, you know, uh, monitoring of the level of consciousness the uh, anesthetist can do, or you can have a trend of four from the median nerve. And uh, if they are, you know, lightly sedated, because neurosurgery, you don't need a deep anesthesia, you know. Neurosurgery exactly. is uh, all very, very light easier anesthesia. mainly. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. I think that is important for the audience. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor. May I request Professor Irion to please comment about Professor Basan's presentation and his experience about epilepsy surgery. Professor Irion. Doctor, Doctor Pant, I'm, I'm, I'm so uh, pleased. It truly has been a privilege to be around at this time uh, on your presentation. I, I come uh, from Albania. And uh, well, your lecture was music uh, to my ears and so dear to my heart. We are a very low resource uh, country. And you, uh, growing from your own experience and then um, setting up uh, this wonderful practice after many years, it doesn't matter how and when you started, but you had the willingness to continue. So if, if, if that me gives me the opportunity from my very, very humble experience. Please allow me to congratulate you. It, it is a role model for any of us coming from low-income countries to set up the way you did and move forward. So please allow me one more time to congratulate you. But now uh, to the organizers, thank you so very much for having me put as a discussion, but I'm in a very bad spot. It, um, having here Dr. Karagizov, who is a mentor of mine, you know, the saying goes on that uh, usually the student grows to be uh, as good or better than the mentor, but wouldn't be that the case. To the day I, I, I go back and forth and consult Dr. Karagizov on his uh, wise opinion. In your work now, I want to go back to Dr. Pant. Um, ECOG uh, is, a, is one of the tools that plays a major role in the tailoring temporal lobectomies. And that's something that you can start doing in low resource income countries. Uh, you can have the tool. We currently have a three Tesla MRI. Now, the problem is that it doesn't serve much of a practical purpose when it comes to standard resection of medial temporal lobe epilepsy. So how much do you depend on its use for practical purposes when it comes to resection of uh, medial temporal lobe epilepsy, how much do you depend on that tool? The point of my question is very simple. We have limited tools that we can use at the time. I understand you have to identify the lesion first, but there are times that it's going to be challenging. Thank you. That would be my question. Yeah, thank you very much, Professor, for your nice words. and. Uh about the comment, um, the question, uh, you, are, you are partly right. When we go in for, let's say, uh, temporal lobectomy, when we have um, temporal lobe sclerosis, hippocampal sclerosis, then we are determined to do whatever we are going to do, you know. So my ECOG may not guide me too much, but 
um, as I've said uh, to the uh, previous question also, you know, it helps me to tailor number one, how much to resect, uh, especially the hippocampus. And mainly it is good for uh, my mind that previously, just before surgery, we were having firing there. And at the end of the surgery, the brain became silent. So I think we have done the job. So it's also for the completeness of the job that we have done, you know. Otherwise, you know, you in especially in temporal lobe epilepsy, maybe it doesn't have that much of a role, but it does definitely have a very, very big role on uh, porencephalic cases that I have done, you know, season cephalic cases that we have done. It really tailors. And uh, many times the epileptic zone is totally different from the lesion itself. So maybe lesionectomy, uh, it helps a lot. And for tailoring at the end of the surgery, it gives you a confidence that you have done your job, something like that. Maybe I have answered your question. You, you did, and I, I am allowed maybe one more minute. Um, I'm amazed. Uh, please allow me to be honest, and um, I don't wanna be any more sincere than uh, what I have been so far. You are so uh, simply spoken so humble in your practice you are not only showing cases of success but you are admitting things that are most of the lectures we hear about are always success 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 but there is failure it is failure so often in neurosurgery and um, from those who try to teach or lecture we very rarely hear that practice or for them to say i don't have the answer it is very normal not to have the answer to admit it requires maybe a certain level of knowledge. And I heard you for the second time saying that, you know, I don't have the answer to that question. It teaches more than all good lectures that we might hear throughout. So one again, thank you. Thank you very much. And going on to the end of uh, your your answer regarding my question. Yes, it, it truly helps. Sometimes it might be difficult to identify where correctly the ictal onset zone is, but in general, uh, the tools that we currently have in a low setting, low income setting, is that you might identify at the best, if not even the epileptogenic lesion, you can have an idea of where the zone is and that you can target that area, which is bigger, which is larger area of, and then you can move forward. Now, with the eco, you can uh, predict how much of uh, the hippocampus you can remove. The, in, in this way, you maximize the seizure-free outcome, but that it allows you to uh, spare what is functionally important, uh, which is uh, way or very close to the, to the epileptogenic lesion, and you want to spare that. So you spare function of, of memory cognition and func um, uh, memory work to your patient so thank you very much it's truly a privilege to have been here today thank you very much dr Adrian. um may i request professor Fawad Birza, the president of uh, afghanistan society of neurosurgeon to please comment about professor basal presentation okay thank you professor uh, and uh, professor Tachin, professor kato it was brilliant thank you very much especially for uh, countries like us, low and middle income countries. That's, the medicine also is uh, very expensive and uh, uh, sometimes persistent to the drug, uh, anti-epileptic drug. And also the, uh, it's very important that the epileptic surgery is uh, brilliant. But I like to know that uh, after surgery, do you continue anti-epileptic drug or uh, just continue the antiplatic drug. Yeah. The second one, uh, you mentioned about vagus nerve stimulation. And uh, do you try it, uh, the first uh, VNS uh, if it's not a uh, response, go to surgery or uh, it's different? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor, for your nice words and questions. Uh, first of all, uh, how long to continue anti-epileptic drug after uh, surgery? Since these are all intractable cases, uh, so difficult cases, so uh, the consensus around the world is to continue it for two years, 
and the patient should be seizure free and the patient should be aura free. If the patient is seizure free or aura free, then you can stop after two years. Aura means seizure. So if there is aura, then you cannot stop it. And uh, the second question is, uh, I didn't get you correctly uh, about stimulation, a VNS. Yeah, VNS. Okay. Uh, VNS so, not the stimulation and bus uh, 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 surgery. No, no. Um, if, the, if there is not a resectable lesion, if we yes. do not find where the epilepsy is coming from, and or it is a multifocal, you know, sometime coming from right or sometime from left, multifocal sort of epilepsy, then only we consider VNS. But before VNS, we always want to try corpus callosotomy. And a simple corpus callosotomy can stop many of these seizures and make it much, much simpler seizure. Maybe they will not have zero seizure, but they will have simpler seizure. And many of them are happy. But if you still continue to have seizure, even after uh, corpus callosotomy, in such cases, uh, we consider VNS. <laughs> and uh, so it's a last resort for us. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. As uh, uh, Professor Sachin mentioned, that I'm from Afghanistan. And uh, it's but, but, but low resource country, when you, you know what's the war. And uh, I will uh, communicate with you for uh, training of our young colleagues. Uh, uh, you mentioned uh, for training and uh, I will uh, communicate through uh, Professor Sachin with you and uh, Professor Kato as well. Thank you. Definitely, I will be more than happy to, you know, show our work to your uh, students. I will be more than happy to accommodate, to keep them, give them accommodation from our institute. Uh, they can stay. Uh, Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, <clears throat> Professor Basan, for being uh, so generous to offer the fellowships for the, uh, especially the students from the low resource countries like Afghanistan. Uh, Professor Fawad Pizat, I will share the email contact of uh, Professor Basan with you, and then you can communicate with him for the okay, thank uh, you. sending of your candidate. Thank you. Thank you very okay. much. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Professor Sach. Yes. Uh, do we have any other questions or any doubts uh, from the panelists or from delegates? I think uh, Dilshad. He raised uh, the hand. Dr. Dilshad, are you there? You raised the hand and then you took the hand down. Uh, hi, everybody. Hi, hi how nice are you? Nice to see you. Hello. Hi, Professor Kato. Everybody, Sachin. Uh, very nice presentation. I have known many things from epilepsy from the very basic uh, points. Thank you so much, Professor. Uh, actually, uh, <clears throat> Professor Pirzat and other professors from experts have given my questions, so they were same questions, I, and I, I got the answers. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Dilshad, for participating uh, and uh, having active impression. Uh, any other questions, uh, Dr. Sneha? You, you want to ask anything? Oh. Yeah, uh, thank you, Professor Khan. It was uh, an amazing lecture. Uh, I really have a very basic question. Uh, what is the role of awake surgery for uh, epilepsy surgery? Which are the specific uh, conditions where you would prefer an awake surgery? Uh, absolutely. Uh, awake surgery is something that we should use more and more. We are using it all the time. And uh, you just need a very nice anesthetist, a friendly, nice anesthetist. Uh, <laughs> then you, any, any center can do uh, awake surgery. It's not fancy, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. So we practice sleep, awake sleep technique, where we put the patient in sleep first and do the craniotomy because that's a noisy part. Uh, you don't want to um, give a lot of apprehension to the patient. And once we have exposed, we ask the patient, the patient is in laryngeal mask, you know, not the intubation, but just laryngeal mm -hmm. mask. So we just take out the laryngeal mask, put the oxygen, and then we start, you know. So when is this best? Um, uh, in the past, we were doing it when we were not sure about memory, uh, whether the memory is being, so we 
show the patient some cards and then like 10 cards, we show them uh, with car or apple or some of these simple things. And then we stimulate the hippocampus and left side of the brain and then ask them again, you know, uh, and if they can uh, answer three or more, then they have, uh, it's okay. They, they, uh, you can take out the hippocampus without, just like water test. Um, but now with, um, uh, and also for motor strip, uh, if you want to avoid, you know, uh, just like the case that I showed. In the past, we used to do awake surgery in that case. But now that we have a very good, um, uh, you know, setup, uh, especially for a neuromonitoring setup and a, not only setup, but very good neuromonitoring technician. This is more important than the machine itself. You know? So we are pretty confident on his use. So these days we are using less and less of uh, awake surgery. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, shortly we are going to have um, a TMS, transcranial uh, magnetic stimulation TMS. Uh, where you, this will this will make things much easier now because it's a neuro navigation based TMS, so you can actually know where exactly the motor strip is or the language area is whether it's on the left or right. It's just by putting the magnet, they will stop speaking, so you know you know exactly whether it's on the left side or right side. But um, still, if uh, there are, if you are not equipped enough, then this is a wonderful technique, and we are, have used many many times. You know, yeah. Thank you very much, Doctor. TMS sounds really exciting. I wish to hear more from you on that another time. Yeah. Okay. Sachin, I think you have to unmute yourself. Oh, thank you very yeah. much, Dr. Sneha. Uh, Dr. Poon, I can see your hand raised. You want to make any comment? Just a, um, a final word. Uh, so, uh, very thanks, uh, Professor Penn. And uh, I would love to uh, visit your center if time is allowed. And on the other way, if you have time to come to Hong Kong, please come and uh, have time to visit uh, my center. We have um, um, epilepsy cases, uh, a lot to discuss with you uh, and gain your experience. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. It's a, that, that's the beauty of this conference. You know, we get to know each other and then we exchange ideas. So again, uh, Yoko Kato, you know, she is doing a wonderful job, you know, connecting all of us together. I will <laughs> certainly love to go there. And you should also visit our institute and, you know, we can work together. Thank you. Sure.